The new HBO Max Harry Potter TV show has a real problem when it comes to the earlier books, in that these books are quite short. I mean sure, they had enough material to make films that were under three hours long, but now they have to turn them into eight or more hours of TV. I recently made a video where I talked about which books lend themselves best to being made into a TV show, and then I made a video about the Philosopher's Stone, and how they can successfully turn that book into a whole season of TV. So now I'm going to talk about the Chamber of Secrets and how they can turn that into season two. Now before I get into the how I would structure this season, there's a few things from the comments on my previous videos that we need to talk about when it comes to what we need to consider to make good TV. Because we can't just copy the book exactly into a TV show. Generally speaking, one of the things that stops us from doing an exact copy is that the books spend a decent amount of time describing setting, or describing thoughts and feelings. The Chamber of Secrets has a decent sized chunk describing how Harry feels after he uses the flu network. Then it goes into a description about what he sees at Borgen and Burke's. And later in the book, there's plenty of passages that talk about how Harry feels inside when everyone thinks he's the heir of Slytherin. Now in a book, these descriptions might be multiple paragraphs long, but on screen, they would take seconds just to be depicted with somebody's facial expression or body language when it comes to communicating how they feel, or setting the scene instead of with descriptions, but a very quick establishing shot or two. Also, where this is one good story, when you're making episodic TV, you need lots of little stories making up the bigger ones. Not just a good season, you need good individual episodes. Because you don't want somebody waiting three weeks, going through three hours of TV, because you're at a slower part of the book. Sure, the diehard fans will love three hours of charms class and Hagrid tending to magical creatures, but the mass market who HBO want to watch their show, they're gonna wanna be engaged. And honestly, this book does not have a ton of subplots. And so ordinarily in TV, if you have an episode where your main plot is moving a bit more slowly, there's a subplot to pick up the slack. Not to mention that each episode needs to do enough to keep you hooked and make you want to come back to watch the next one the following week. And we have that at moments in this book with the nine and three quarters barrier being blocked, with Harry hearing whispers in the walls before finding the first person being petrified or, or cat. But Mrs. Norris being petrified, the very first mention of the Chamber of Secrets is 100 pages into a 250 page book. That's 40% of the way through the book. So if we assume eight episodes in the season and it's gonna be a like for like copy with the book, we'd be almost halfway through episode four before we even get to any mention of the Chamber of Secrets. And between the barrier for nine and three quarters not opening for Harry and Ron, and the Chamber of Secrets being announced as being open, there's not a whole lot of mystery or intrigue in the middle there. Not enough to fill three and a half episodes. One final thing that's important is that even though the show is called Harry Potter, we have an important ensemble cast, particularly with Ron and Hermione. Those characters need to be able to shine consistently through the show. And honestly, the Chamber of Secrets doesn't give them too many moments to develop their characters through the book. Episodes need to present obstacles for those supporting characters to overcome, to show that through the season, they've gone on a journey too. And without pulling specific moments from each book, off the top of my head, I feel like maybe the Chamber of Secrets is the worst book at giving characters like Ron and Hermione those moments. But with all of that said, let's get into how I would structure this season of the Harry Potter TV show. So episode one is gonna pick up just as the book does with Harry being miserable at the Dursleys, preparing for the Masons to come when Dobby shows up. And Dobby hits himself in the head with a lamp for a little while, warns Harry not to go back to Hogwarts, does magic to sabotage Harry, then Harry gets himself locked in his room at the Dursleys before Ron, Fred, George, and the Flying Ford Anglia show up to break him out. In theory, that could just be two thirds of an episode, giving you a chance to get to the burrow before the first episode ends, but I think in this season, I wanna focus on the Golden Trio having their own episodes to shine, and by ending it with the breakout, this is clearly Harry's episode, and it leaves episode two to be Ron's episode. And I think there is enough for that to all make one full episode, though, it's a fairly weak one as premieres go. Like, you could spend a good amount of time on Harry's misery at the Dursleys and how badly they still treat him. On how Harry isn't getting any post from his friends and he feels so alone before Dobby shows up and there's Dobby's ominous warnings, but also the reveal that Dobby is stealing all of his letters. Then when Dobby does the magic and ruins the meeting with the Masons, there's the letter from the Ministry telling Harry he can't do magic outside of Hogwarts, which becomes an important moment of foreshadowing for the Order of the Phoenix, when Harry gets a similar 
similar letter after the whole thing with the Dementors and Little Whinging. So I would like to give that a good amount of time so that the callback later kind of makes sense. And then you can draw out the escape because remember in the movies they sort of skip the part where the twins climb into the house and pick the lock downstairs to get all of Harry's luggage. So that can play out as being kind of suspenseful until Vernon catches them and then it can be kind of comedic like it is in the films. The episode has conflict with the Dursleys, tension with the breakout, resolution with the escape, character moments with Harry feeling alone and abandoned. There's a mystery from Dobby keeping us intrigued. It's an okay episode. Everything is kind of surface level. There's not tons to sink our teeth into, but it's fine, I suppose. <laughs> And that brings us on to episode two, which would be Ron's episode. And even though it's still from Harry's point of view, kind of, it would be Ron-centric in terms of the plot. So Ron talks about his summer while they're in the car, flying to the burrow, and then we see where he lives. And we meet his parents, and we have the denoming of the burrow. We can spend more time talking about Arthur's job, particularly his raids, because this is an important setup for Lucius having the diary, and the scene later of Lucius in Borgin and Burks. In the films, Arthur is kind of a caricature, he's just a bit funnily obsessed with muggles. But in the books, there is some important stuff he's doing on people who are enchanting muggle artifacts, kind of making them dangerous. After all the stuff with the Weasleys, we would have the flu powder, the scene in Borgin and Burks where Harry sees Draco and Lucius, which has been perfectly set up with all the chats with Arthur. In particular, we have that conversation between Lucius and the shopkeeper, I can't remember if it's Borgin or Burke off the top of my head, about how Lucius wants to hide some of his items in case he's raided. And seeing Draco poke around Borgen and Burks gives us a great chance to get a glimpse of a necklace and a vanishing cabinet that might be very important in a later season. Then we get Harry leaving Borgen and Burks and all of Diagon Alley, including meeting Hermione and her parents. Because that's something huge that they left out of the movies. Hermione's parents come to Diagon Alley in this book, and it's important to know that muggles can come to Diagon Alley. Also, we get some wonderful muggle-loving excitement from Mr. Weasley as he greets them, and is fascinated by their five-pound notes. We'll get some fabulous Diagon Alley scenes, culminating in Flourish and Blots, where we meet Gilderoy Lockhart, and Mr. Weasley and Lucius Malfoy get into a fist fight, and where subtly, Lucius puts the diary from Tom Riddle into Ginny's transfiguration book. We then get the trip to King's Cross, specifically the fact that they have to keep popping back to the burrow because certain Weasley members have forgotten certain things. Specifically Ginny saying she has to go back because she forgot her diary. Then at King's Cross, we have the barrier being closed, Ron flying himself and Harry to Hogwarts before crashing into the Whomping Willow, Ron's wand being snapped and ending with the two of them not getting expelled. This episode gives us so much backstory about Ron and his family, and it's important to Ron's character across all of the books that we establish how overshadowed he feels by his siblings. He feels almost invisible compared to how many brothers and sisters he has. That becomes really important in The Goblet of Fire and in The Deathly Hallows, so we really need to focus in on those dynamics as early as this book. There's plenty of conflict again. There's the Malfoys in Borgen and Burks, which gives us enough mystery to be getting on with. Some high energy stuff with the fight in the shop and having to fly the car to Hogwarts before almost getting beaten up by a tree. It's a pretty good episode, and if they do season premieres as double bills, I think those two go together quite well to tell a good opening cohesive story. And that brings us to episode three, which is a good episode for plot development where the two episodes previous have been a little bit slower paced, focusing on a little bit more characterization. This one advances the plot. So the year at Hogwarts starts, we'll have some classes, some scenes just doing day-to-day -day stuff at Hogwarts, the Quidditch practice scene where we find out that Malfoy's dad brought Draco's way onto the team. We'll also have some Lockhart classes, which obviously go terribly, as well as other Lockhart scenes to show us how insufferable he is. He'll give Harry advice on being famous and managing his fans and handing out signed photographs. And this episode will carry us to Halloween, where we'll finally get Nick's death day party, something a lot of fans wanted but didn't get in the movie. We'll have Harry's detention with Lockhart, where he's signing autographs for him, ending with him hearing whispers in the walls talking about killing and getting blood. And when he follows the whispers, the episode ends when he finds Mrs. Norris and the bloody writing on the wall that the chamber has been opened. It's another Harry-focused episode, which makes sense, he's the main character, but it advances the plot significantly and it introduces the main plot arc. It does a good job of fleshing out everyday life at Hogwarts, gives us a chance to spend time with some more supporting characters like maybe Neville in the everyday Hogwarts scenes. It's a solid third episode. So with episode three ending with the reveal of the petrified cat and the Chamber of Secrets being opened, 
Episode 4 can open with students whispering, and rumours about the chamber. We'll get sly comments from Malfoy about it all, him acting smug. And then we'll go to History of Magic class, where they ask Professor Binns about the chamber, because yes, unlike in the movies where it was McGonagall who told them about the chamber, it's actually the ghost professor of History of Magic who tells the students all about the legend of the Chamber of Secrets. And this could allow us a good 10-15 minute flashback scene of the founders coming together, as Binns tells the story of the four of them starting Hogwarts. It can show us Slytherin being a parcel mouth, him really valuing pure bloods, falling out with the others, hiding his chamber in the castle with a monster in it. Like the Wizarding World doesn't have a great track record of adding random information and random scenes that weren't in the books, like the burning of the burrow for example, but since this show's showrunner, is from The Last of Us, where they had a phenomenal episode about Frank and Bill, which wasn't actually in the source material. I trust them to do this well. So after we find out about the founders and the chamber, we could have a rogue bludger Quidditch match and a dueling club. Now it does feel like a lot in the back half of the episode to do both the rogue bludger Quidditch match and the dueling club. Because remember, at the end of the Quidditch match, we find out that Colin Creevy has been petrified too. But I'm not sure how else to pace it because we can't really do the rogue bludger at the end of episode three, where Colin is petrified because we don't know about the Chamber of Secrets yet. So we sort of have to cram both of them into the last half of this episode. Which of course gives us the reveal that Dobby was behind the bludger and closing the gate to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. But we definitely need the Dueling Club in this episode because it comes after all the information about Salazar Slytherin so that everyone being suspicious of Harry for speaking parcel tongue in Dueling Club actually makes sense. <laughs> So after a very jam-packed episode 4 and dueling club where everyone thinks Harry is the heir of Slytherin, Harry's gonna still have a few important moments since he's the main character, but he can also sit back a little bit and give us a Hermione-centric episode. You see, in episode 5, I feel like we'll have Hermione taking the lead on making the Polyjuice Potion. And that, of course, leads us to Meet Moaning Myrtle. I would be willing to audition. So we'd have the trio talking about, could Malfoy be the heir of Slytherin? No suspicions rising. More interactions between Harry and the Hufflepuffs who are suspicious that he's the heir. Culminating in Justin Finch Fletchley and nearly Headless Nick both being petrified. And then we'd have Malfoy going around talking about how he hopes Hermione it's the first person the monster actually kills instead of just petrifying. He'd use the word mudblood, we'd get a more book accurate version of finding out what mudblood means. Because Hermione sure as heck doesn't know, she grew up around muggles. But that prejudice against Hermione gives us more opportunity to explore her character and themes that will be important for her character for the rest of the series. Harry would go to Dumbledore's office and meet Forks, which is important for later, and speak to the Sorting Hat about if it should have put him in Slytherin. Hermione would steal potion ingredients from Snape's office, which is a huge jump in character growth for her. And we'd end with Christmas and the Polyjuice Potion scene where Harry and Ron take the form of Crab and Goyle, where's Malfoy, and then the episode would end with the reveal that Hermione has turned into a cat. Similar to Ron's episode earlier in the season, we would get a lot of information about Hermione and some important details about her character. Like until now, she has been a stickler for the rules, but her Gryffindor side comes out in this episode when she's willing to steal ingredients from Snape because it will help solve the mystery and stop the attacks. And we learn about the prejudice against Muggleborns, which will also be a key point of her character through the other seasons of the show. So every member of the trio has had their chance to shine in this season, at least with one episode. So that's a big tick for me. In episode 6, Hermione would be in the hospital wing because she's trying to turn back from a cat into a human, and then Harry would find Riddle's diary after it was thrown into Moaning Myrtle's toilet. Now, much like with the founders earlier, I'd like a good 15 minute scene where we see the events from 50 years earlier when Tom Riddle was at Hogwarts. We would see more of his interactions with Dumbledore, making it clear that Dumbledore never truly trusted him, even back then. And then maybe we get a bit more about Hagrid being expelled. Maybe we even see his wand being snapped and him being hired back to the school on Dumbledore's request. After the flashback scene, Hermione would come out of the hospital wing, we'd have discussions between the trio about Hagrid and if he could have opened the chamber and if he could have done it again. We'd have some classes, see some students being escorted around Hogwarts by teachers and prefects, general stuff to see how the tension in the castle has risen. And then we'd have Neville telling Harry that somebody ransacked his room and Harry realizes the diary has been stolen. This episode would end with the Quidditch match being cancelled before McGonagall takes Harry and Ron to the hospital wing to reveal that Hermione was petrified. So episode 7 would start with Harry and Ron going to confront Hagrid, but before they can, the minister appears 
and Hagrid is taken to Azkaban. Meanwhile, Lucius Malfoy shows up, tells Dumbledore the governors want him removed. We get the whole follow the spiders comment, and we'll have a few scenes in Hogwarts between Harry and Ron, everyone in disarray now that Dumbledore has been kicked out, and then eventually, Harry and Ron will see a trail of spiders and follow them into the forest, giving us everything with Aragog. We get that horrendous scene with lots of terrifying spiders trying to eat these children before the flying car, of course, comes and saves them. They end up back at the castle, and that's when they put everything from Aragog together to figure out that Myrtle was killed by the monster from the chamber. And then en route to the bathroom, McGonagall intercepts them, and she's like, what do you think you're doing out of bed, you silly little students? And they don't want to get in trouble, so they're like, we're not going to the bathroom, we're, uh, we're going to see Hermione, our best friend who was almost killed. And McGonagall gets a tear in her eye, and she says, of course, let me take you up to the hospital wing. Then when they get to the hospital wing, McGonagall leaves them to give them some privacy. They find the page in Hermione's arm, which says all about the basilisk, and the word pipes written on her arm. So they figure out the mystery, and they go to the staff room to tell McGonagall, but on the way, the the episode ends with the reveal that Ginny has been taken into the Chamber of Secrets with the message her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. Not a bad cliffhanger going into the finale. So the final episode. Lockhart, who we've established as being completely useless, is volunteered to go into the chamber and save Ginny. So Harry and Ron go to tell him everything they know. And there they learn that he's a fraud, he's a coward, and they force him at one point to go into the Chamber of Secrets. Myrtle tells Harry that if he dies down there, he can share her bathroom, what a heartwarming moment, before they enter the chamber and we get the backfiring memory charm when Lockhart uses Ron's broken wand. Causes things to collapse, Harry is on his own and he has to go into the chamber, confront the memory of Riddle, fight the basilisk with the help of Forks and the sorting hat before eventually destroying the diary. We would also get the typical end of season scene with Dumbledore explaining all the plot gaps that we hadn't filled in. But unlike in the movie, which came out before any of the books that mentioned any Horcruxes, they can write in some foreshadowing here with the diary being a Horcrux when Harry hands it to Dumbledore. Of course, Dumbledore's not entirely sure, but this is where he starts to get a hunch. Or I think he had hunches before, but he says that's when they started to be confirmed and he started operating under that assumption. Maybe, I don't know, when Harry destroys the Horcrux, there's like a flash or something reminiscent of what he will feel later when he destroys the Horcruxes in the final season. Now, although the fight with the Basilisk could be pretty epic, I actually think the penultimate episode was more high octane than the finale. But that is my structure of trying to fit this book into a well-paced eight-episode season. If you want to see how I arrange season one from The Philosopher's Stone, you can watch this video here.